So in this section, we're going to talk about the treatment of metastatic, newly diagnosed renal cell carcinoma. And to start us off, Raj, let me go back to you. T tell us a little bit about how do you risk stratify patients who are coming in now with, with newly diagnosed metastatic disease? So the most commonly, uh, we use uh, uh, IMDC risk criteria, and we include the six following variables in that risk stratification, and which include uh, uh, presence of anemia, uh, high neutrophil counts, high platelet counts, time of onset of metastasis, like how long it took to uh, have metastasis to happen, more than one year or less than one year from the original diagnosis of kidney cancer, performance status, and high calcium. So out of these six criteria, if somebody has none of them, we classify them as favorable risk category patients. Patients with one or two of them, we call them to have intermediate risk disease. And anybody will, with three or more of these uh, get characterized into poor risk category. But, okay. but remember that three is not six. <laughs> so a person with a three is still pretty good. And a two is almost as good as a one. So, you know, it's, you got to be a little bit, uh, you know, I call it Kentucky windage. You know, you sort of figure out how you're going to, aim the gun and hope you pick up the right curve on the, on, the, on the gun. So you're not always worried too much about those subsets. I think that's a good point in, in that this is a continuum. Let me ask you guys, is there one factor, if you had to pick, that's more important than some of the other ones, maybe more specific than some of the other ones? I would say performance status yeah, is probably I, I the most important for me. Yeah, I use anemia. You know, if they're anemic and if they present with de novo, metastatic disease, that's not going to be good. Yeah, I think it's that time from nephrectomy to metastasis. And particularly for the people that are, you know, that, that are really long, that are two or three years out, even if they've got, you know, a little bit of anemia or something else, I'm less worried about that. It's the patients that are really presenting right. with newly right. diagnosed disease and then maybe have one or two other factors that I'm really nervous right. about. So if I had to pick one thing to me for that, it's that, it's that timing, that natural history. It's very, very specific to kidney cancer. Well, for the favorable risk, I mean, if you've got a nephrectomy 12 years ago and you got three small lung nodules, I mean, those are people that most of us would watch, right? I mean... That's right. I think it's an excellent point. I mean, are there sort of a, a routine practice, if you will, for a subset of patients that you'll really consider for active surveillance or deferred therapy and follow? And, and, and Bob, in your practice, how do, how do you follow? So, I mean, the hardest conversation when you have a referral from a, from a urologist after they've had a nephrectomy is with, despite small pulmonary nodules or minimal uh, mediastinal adenopathy, is say, we're gonna watch you. And, you know, having come to us anticipating a therapy, and we're sort of saying, let's redir redirect our goals. Our goals here are long-term survival, not the immediacy of putting you on a therapy, which will at a certain period of time be a chronic therapy. And once you really start a therapy, you're not really coming off therapy. You know, you know, immunotherapy may be a different discussion. So it's a reestablishment of the goals. And then uh, obviously you look at the risk factors. I think that patients with intermediate risk, small volume disease, slow growing disease. Again, a lot of times we may also see these patients for the first time having had the first scan and we have to sort of take a step back Rescan them two, three months later, see if their disease is changing, how they're doing symptomatically. And it really is, I don't look at one factor that can sort of predict how they're going to do. You really have to use the whole categorization of the patient and really put it together and requires more than one visit that can get you the gestalt about what these patients are going to do. Yeah. And they may evolve in front of you or mm -hmm. they may just be a very slow grower. And it's just, again, back to the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Brad, I mean, you're, you know, again, you're a little new to the field, but, you know, we've been doing metastatectomy for a while in this field. Do you still do that at Dana-Farber? I mean, are there still patients that you'll consider, you know, resection of metastatic disease? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a patient who has, like, oligometastatic disease that you can render disease-free with mm -hmm. surgery, specifically if they're maybe have a long time, like, from the current, they had nephrectomy five years ago, and mm -hmm. some of the single lung lesion, those are patients we absolutely would talk with the thoracic surgeons and talk about metastatectomy with the hope that you achieve potentially a cure or a minimum like long-term disease control and avoid unnecessary therapy for right, these patients. Right. And Naraj, now we, we, you know, we got more options in surgery, right? Now SBRT is 
really picking up in our field, you know, stereotactic body radiotherapy. How, how are you using that at your center? I think there are always going to be some patients who are not surgical candidates. So in the absence of um, high level evidence uh, for uh, use of radiation therapy and other kind of energy directed therapy, if you will, uh, I would pick up patients for those options only if they are not surgical candidates. Well, for example, solitary bone met. Mm -hmm. You know, those yeah. are people that you, you may well use a cyberknife on. In fact, I think SWOG has been thinking about how to design a trial around uh, oligo metastatic renal cell mm -hmm. uh, surgery or cyber knife or stuff like that. So I think for the very good risk patients who you don't want to jump in with toxic therapy, I think you want to have this option uh, of surgery or cyber knife or active surveillance. Yeah. And, and they go together, right? You can do a right. one, one or mix or match. And, you know, we've had patients where we've done this and then, you know, follow them for a period of time. Right, there are some patients, you know, if they're having liver involvement, uh, extensive bone involvement, uh, lymph predominant disease, you anticipate that these patients are not going to be the ideal active surveillance patients. So on those, you should be thinking mm -hmm. about soon enough to implement some type of therapy. But I think, as Dr. Vogelsang is saying, the postponement of the first therapy with metastasectomies and SBRT, you're giving your patients time to heal, physically and mentally, about their new condition, and then again, postponing that initial therapy because, you know, we have no problem seeing patients ever so often, but they enjoy not coming to our office. <laughs>